Okay, so thanks very much to the organizing committee. It's a privilege to talk to you tonight in celebration of, of that 125 years. And I hope to share with you some of our new innovations regarding the discovery of cold sintering and to also uh, make some historical links to events um, going on in our college that are um, somewhat inspirational to the research in hand. So in today's presentation, I don't only want to communicate with you the discovery of cold sintering, but I also want to basically make these links to the past. Um, I hope that comes across in doing that. Um, first of all, I want to share with you some of the motivations that got me thinking about cold sintering. After all, my research has been in electronic ceramic materials and mostly interested about the material physics and, uh, and the properties and the applications of those types of materials. But um, given the motivations that I will share with you in a while, you will see that, um, that it got me to rethink about ways of actually making materials. And the motivation for that obviously was the stresses that we have Think, thinking about more sustainable approaches and um, climate change. I'll remind you about what is sintering. Um, I'll introduce to you um, what, cold, what the cold sintering process is, um, how we can design new materials with cold sintering, and give a number of examples of devices and various different materials that have been now fabricated with cold sintering over the last six years or so. And it offers new pathways to, to think about how to scale the technology. And I'll show you some of the preliminary results that we have as we step down the, the, translational, the translational part of taking stuff from the laboratory into the next stages for prototyping. And then finally, um, uh, there's a lot of discussion on, on, on resources, critical resources and so forth. And um, I'll point out, um, or I should rather accurately say, um, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Dr. Enrique Gomez, has pointed out that cold sintering can sit at the center of a cyclic economy. And I will talk a little bit about those ideas as well that we are working on. So motivation. Um, so as I said, I've worked on electroceramics for a long time and certainly electroceramics have for battery capacitors, fuel cells, and many other forms of, of materials and devices that potentially can help the, uh, the overall climate issue. But at the end of the day, um, it is very important for every scientist, young scientist or old scientist, to think about the, uh, the reasons for doing research. This has been educated us from Einstein, uh, uh, thinking about humanity and technology and the importance of not getting lost in, in your grasp and in your equations. And certainly a, a old EMS um, student at the time in the 1950s, Rustam Roy in geosciences, who then spent his whole career um, at Penn State really driving interdisciplinary research, really got us over those years to embrace complex problems. And I pulled upon one of his books, one of his many books. This one's called Experimenting with the Truth, the Fusion of Religion with Technology Needed for, human for Humanity's Survival. And this is a rather intriguing book written in 1976. And one of the things contained within it is this rather interesting human impact factor equation, which has whatever the impact is, is being influenced by the potential number of people being affected by a phenomena, the probability of that event, the intensity of that effect, and the duration of that effect. And back in the 1960s, he sort of almost had the same list as this. It's been updated with some insights that I've put to it. But at the top of his list was nuclear and biological warfare, which is, given in 1976, you know, the height of the Cold War, this is probably not a surprise. But... I would argue that, that now some of these issues are there. Probably the top issue is climate change. So as a material scientist, how do we now help to address 
climate change. Then it's really got to be through our production and also through our engineering. Um, I will point out that one of the biggest sources for um, um, for CO2 emissions previously was lighting. And since the development of solid state lighting, that is almost off the top 100 list in terms of drawdown strategies. Um, also, being in our college, you know, obviously um, um, we've got fantastic climate scientists. Um, everybody knows that there's a very, very strong group in here. One of them is uh, Michael Mann. And certainly um, people like myself that, that follows data and follows the data from this group um, you, you can see the significance of the hockey stick trans, uh, 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 data translation and looking at the anomalous climb of that type of data is absolutely petrifying to people that are data driven. And so one has to ask, what can I do for our future generations? And it's that sort of motivation that got me thinking differently about how to process materials. Now, the sorts of materials that we're talking about here is ceramics. And ceramics are actually the oldest of the of humankind manufacturing from at least an additive perspective. I don't know if you've ever seen this lady here before, but this was found in the Czech Republic and has been carbon dated to be 29,000 years BC. So mankind has been basically consolidating particulates of minerals and then densifying them and shaping them and then firing them through a sintering process into a solid form for, um, for over 30,000 years. That is really hard to contemplate in terms of the age of materials, but that was probably the first synthetic process that, um, that um, Stone Age man basically did in, um, in, in, um, um, in such a long time ago. And obviously there's many examples that translate many, many of the eras of mankind, but in the more later 100 years, advanced ceramics has been there, particularly in the last 50 years. And so you've got materials like this that are used in microwave technology, um, um, bioceramic materials for hip implants, insulative type materials, capacitors, over 4 trillion of these are made out of ceramic material. There's probably a thousand of them in your cell phone. And these are the sort of areas that I work on. This gentleman here was an inspiration to many of us in our college and in our department. It's Bob Newnham, who's a National Academy member. And he developed uh, piezo um, composite materials that then basically, if any of you have ever had an ultrasound, it's that technology that he won the Franklin Medal for that is there, and it's again an electro-ceramic. And any more um, energy-related applications, there are things like fuel cells and batteries that are now emerging within this field. But all of these materials are all sintered at very high temperatures. I use furnaces in a factory floor, like these different examples here all over, and, and, and they generate enormous amounts of waste, waste heat in the densification process of these ceramics. Remember taking these powders and then driving them into a dense monolithic sample going from about 40% dense to about 98% um, dense. And in doing so being driven by the thermodynamic process of minimizing surface area. And the sort of temperature profiles that these furnaces take is processes that then remove organics say at 500 degrees, and then driving a temperature up to temperatures such as 1,000 to 1,600 degrees Celsius. Just imagine the heat that gets generated from your oven when you're cooking a pizza at 450 Celsius. This is cel uh, uh, 450 Fahrenheit, not, uh, not 1,600 Celsius. So enormous amounts of heat, enormous amounts of heat loss, enormous levels of inefficiency. And if you're paying the bills for these processes. As a manufacturer and an engineer, you are also basically costing your company a lot of money in the fabrication of such a process. So is there a different way? And this was a question that I asked myself over eight years ago. And there was a lot of reading that I did, including readings inspired by some of our colleagues like Sue Brantley and others. I had minerals in my room. You can see here some quartz. I had um, a, 
pearl, which is a biomineralization process, and some sedimentous rock that I got from Dresden on a trip once. And there are many, many clues that, that how these are made are not made in a way naturally that uses a furnace. They use processes such as weathering, pressure, and solution precipitation and methods like this to then drive it. Even sitting in a damp kitchen in, uh, um, in say, Scarborough in England at some time, looking at a, a, um, a sugar bowl, you can see that the crystals are undergoing a densification and sintering. All of these are clues that there may be a better way to sinter materials. So the basic process is the following. There is powder, we add a liquid transient phase, we apply a pressure, we add a moderate temperature, and as that liquid touches the surfaces of these powders, it drives a dissolution process. The same way as sugar is, 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 is dissolved into your, into your warm cup of tea this evening. Um, and then as you then evaporate that off by a heat treatment of driving it towards the evaporation of water, say 100 degrees, then that sugar then supersaturates and then reprecipitates. In this case, you're driving the surface into a solution in the liquid, and then you're basically supersaturating it and it's reprecipitating. And the dynamics and transport of all those processes then allows this to then densify at temperatures previously unrealized, like 150 degrees Celsius. At, um, um, and in also very short times. And so these dynamics of really low temperatures, apply pressures, moderate pressures, anywhere between 70 megapascals to 500 megapascals, not geopascal levels, the activity, the all-important chemical activity of time is critical to this densification process. So uh, if we consider like a scale here uh, in, in terms of Celsius, most sintering of oxides are in this range, 1,000 to 1,700. The cold sintering allows us to work right down here. So it's like a 10 to 1 ratio. In fact, the rule of thumb in a textbook is the sintering temperature over the melting temperature lies between 0.5 to 0.95. Cold sintering is below 0.2, often 0.1. So in the case of barium titanate, this is cold sintered barium titanate, you can see here beautiful triple points between three adjacent grains, a dense microstructure. And, um, and then here is all the best in class of all the other fancy techniques to sinter, including spark plasma sintering, microwave sintering, conventional sintering, et cetera. Cold sintering is over here, much lower temperatures and also significantly faster times. So we're looking at a 10 to one change in the total energy um, if not greater, at, at, at least 10 to 1 in terms of that. And to give you a 10 to 1 perspective in physical scale, it would be like this gentleman here looking at this aeroplane being reduced by 10 to 1. So it really gives you a perspective. This is a massive change that we have um, as an option to how to process materials and densify them. Um, we've done over 100 different compounds now, um, not just oxides, but, but a variety of different materials. And more than just densifying them as a ceramic, we've designed them in ways that we've even made electric devices and found processes to take our stack, put electrodes in system to make devices. And over here, you can see multi-layer type devices for a barista um, um, being made where we're also not just co-sintering the ceramic, but also the metal electrodes all within this same process. And I think this work was done at 150. And we're also looking at how to assemble new solid state batteries with this same type of technology. More than just ceramics, um, what this offers with this basically severe reduction of the processing temperature of a ceramic, we now can push the ceramic processing temperature in the domain of where we do polymers and polymer, polymerizations, cross-linking and flow processes with polymers. So now you can actually make new types of composites where you can put small amounts of polymer in the grain boundaries of ceramic materials to develop completely new nanocomposites with new types of properties. You can combine metals, you can combine semiconductors, gels as we have in some of the, um, in some of the battery materials. And in fact, we're even, I have a colleague in England 
even looking to incorporate living materials into the ceramic matrix at lower temperatures. So just to prove to you that these must be low temperatures, you can see here the densified microstructure, the sort of classic 120 degree angles between densified ceramics. But when you look more closely in the TM, in this particular case, there's a polymer around each grain boundary. In this case, a silicon elastic, only up to about five volume percent in this particular case, but still maintaining um, densities above 96%. And you can see from the densification that this all happens within 10 minutes, right? Typically just sintering zinc oxide takes multiple hours, right? This is happening within 10 minutes and densifying the materials, but leaving a polymer also in the grain boundary. So you can have it free of polymer or with various different volume fractions of polymer and different chemistries of polymer, all making up these types of composites. So it opens up the enormous way of which various different aspects of material science can interact within this processing platform. Not just polymers, it can also be nanomaterials. Here you can see some nano so-called 2D materials. Penn State is very, very big in 2D material. We've got over 50 faculty working in nanomaterials uh, with, uh, with these 2D type, type uh, morphologies. So here you can actually disperse around your ceramic nanomaterials that are 2D in shape around each of the individual Brains, and then center this whole thing together and trapping that in all at this sort of five nanometer scale. Over here, we've done the equivalent with the old fashioned buckyball. Right? Very, very similar. You see the buckyballs and the grain boundaries. So clearly you can do a lots of different types of innovative things with these, but at the end of the day, if we are going to impact society, we've got to be able to translate it out of the laboratories. And so to do that, we're starting to look on how to print and, 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 and densify materials on different types of substrates, metals, plastics, how to make tiles on larger and larger scales, but still having high densities. And we've started to do this now, even with thinking about a continuous process, um, which I don't have time to go into at the moment. It's still very much in its early days, but you can see there is a route towards the manufacturing of such a technology to then be able to make new types of devices and to be able to scale them to impact society. And as I mentioned earlier on, one of my colleagues, uh, Enrique Gomez, um, um, pointed out to me that this may be the ideal process for really creating a cyclic economy particularly though the fact that you can put polymers into the grain boundaries of a ceramic material. So you can make a material which is maybe 95% um, ceramic, two to 5% of, uh, of a polymer. You can cold sinter it. You can have the properties that you almost, uh, almost uh, would see with a normal ceramic, but then you can then do an extraction process to then get rid of that polymer, either by heat or by a solvent as extraction. And then recover really the all important um, materials that may actually have compositions with very rare, uh, rare earths. They may have um, you know very expensive levels of purity to those powders, and you could take those, mill them down again, and then redrive this into then a reuse um, uh, cycle. Because again, after some milling, you could add it with the polymer, drive the cold sintering, make your devices again. And we've started to do some of these types of demonstrations with some of the mega applications that obviously are there with electroceramics, such as some of the batteries. Okay. So as we wrap up here this evening and open it up for questions, this is an idea that came to us um, over six years ago, actually it's more like eight years ago. Um, it was driven out of need and guilt to try and figure out a way that where a very, very high temperature process could be brought into lower temperatures. It's opened our eyes to many, many more new opportunities. And um, it's been, the work has been sponsored by the Center for Dielectrics and Piezoelectrics, companies, National Science Foundation, the Air Force. And in some of the technologies that we've developed, we've got over 14 companies looking to license this. So these are massive companies 
that are helping us to then transition this to then benefit society. And remember that most materials breakthroughs take an enormous length of time to go from benchtop to society. Often most of the, most of the transitions or translations of this of materials technology can take up to 15 years. But with very early partnership here, we hope that we can accelerate that process because at the end of the day, um, uh, developing new sustainable manufacturing processes has to be a priority for um, materials manufacturing and opportunities to then help the, um, the energy budgets that we are generating for our society. So I'll leave you with the thoughts of Vincent van Gogh. Great things are done not by impulse, but by a series of small things brought together. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Clive. Um, so we're gonna get started with the question and answer portion. Um, one of the first questions that came in is about how this is fascinating, how there is a low temperature process that can build a material or a product in 10 minutes. Um, wondering, are we past the R&D phase to commercialization for any type of product? So um, not yet. We um, both Dr. McKinstry, Susan McKinstry, and myself had a project with a company that I probably can't give the name of, but it was a biomedical company, and we thought that we had a a, a demonstration that they were going to buy into. They sponsored the work. Um, they even patented the work in partnership with us. Um, but that didn't happen. There are other companies that uh, are buying into the license and some of them have been visiting scientists from some of the Japanese companies that have worked with me um, to help with some of the development of this. They have gone back to their respective um, uh, companies and are working towards that end. And um, so it is beyond the R&D stage. I would say that it's in some places at the pilot level. Um, which is really exciting. Um, I guess a follow up to that would be which which industry or specific type of you know product do you think we expect to see this come out first using the cold centering? Yeah, I think because uh, I'd work so closely with the electronic ceramic type companies, the ones are. Um, that were aware of it earlier than others because of the work being done in the um, Center for Dielectrics and Piezoelectrics. So they basically had a four to five year, three to four year jump on this. Um, and then there are also some, you know, they're often highly valued products. And so the profit margins are a little bit different from say bricks and other things like this. We also have very recently published some work um, with some of our colleagues at the Dubois University, at, at, at Dubois, the uh, Penn State campus. And, um, and there we've been able to translate this process to metals. And already some very, very large parts have been made in a powder metallurgy company um, and, um, and almost within the production line that was already in place for traditional powder metallurgy. So we're quite excited about that as we, as we go forward as well. So it's, it's very much happening on multiple fronts um, and, um, and we still continue to do R&D research. We still don't fully understand all the mechanisms, but the true value of this will come in, 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 in the early applications um, to come forward. So, I think it's going to be electronic ceramics, but it, it may be metals based upon how fast that particular area has moved. All right. Um, a question that kind of came in is one of the problems with structural ceramics is the cost associated with the need for high temperature sintering. What is the prospect of this methodology being applied to carbide, nitride, and boride ceramics? 
Yeah, so that's a brilliant question. That's uh, we've asked ourselves many times before, and um, what I will say in terms of the structural materials, ignoring the the chemistries that we just said, is that we've been, we've successfully done, had some very good results with with zirconia. Now that's not a nitride or a carbide, and um, and I, I think the process is absolutely ubiquitous. But really what it takes is a very, very good chemist to understand these interfacial reactions. And I think we need to have chemists that really understand carbide and nitride um, surfaces and solvents and, um, and maybe metal organics solvents that, that could then drive the dissolutions process for alumina or silica in those types of materials. At this point, I do not know how to do it, and it's not obvious how to do how to, how to do that. Um, but you're right; structural materials are very interesting. I know that we could do it in zirconia, the the, the, the covalently bonded alumina nitrides and carbon and carbides, etc. That's a tougher egg to crack. It needs a clever chemist. Um. Can the U.S. provide all the materials necessary for the low temp process, or does this require us to continue to import raw material? Yeah, that's a, that's a, also a very good question, right? Um, I, I mean, um, interestingly enough, there is some. Uh, we've had some. Some of my students are very creative, and I've had one of my students uh, reach out to um, some of the mining waste that is there in York County, and um, he's made some very, very primitive but good-looking brick structures. I mean, not large bricks and making one at a time, but, but tile-like structures out of some of that waste uh, that is coming out of the mining industry. So there may be some opportunities. I think for the advanced electroceramics, the stuff that I know a lot, lot more about. There, the purities are really important. Um, of course, you can mine them from overseas, many of them Australia, many of them China, some of them Russian. So that is still, um, um, there, there is still a logistical portfolio for how you bring these advanced materials to a factory here in the US. And so until we get enough and drive the cyclic economy, um, I think we're always gonna be somewhat dependent upon those, even if everything which we've talked about here comes true. So I guess moving, continuing with the cyclic economy, does low temp sintering enhance the ability to recycle lithium batteries for example, enhancing the viability of this battery technology. Yeah, that's 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 obviously an area where we think um, you do have the value added, where you can where you can actually recover a lot of those materials, the cobalt, and and basically the lithium cobalt and, or, or, or or the manganese, uh, 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 the nickel manganese cobalt type formulations and then basically recover them and um, and then recycle them if the life cycle analysis allowed you to bring enough together to then actually give it as a net gain but in principle yes the battery area is a very good one and we've got um, a number of people working in that space uh, what is the typical composition of the liquid phase? Does the production of the liquid phase negate any significant portion of the energy savings? Yeah, it, it's it's the, the liquid phase is critical. It doesn't have to be much, by the way. It can be just a few percent of, of by volume, and but it has to allow for the control of congruent or near congruent dissolution. So you're balancing the chemistry at that surface. And so designing that is a lot of the tricks that has to be thought through, particularly for more complicated chemistries where it's very easy to have differential dissolution rates. Um, um, in some of the batteries, for example, we look at just polar solvents. In more simpler materials, good old water. Um, um, 
acid base chemistries to then drive the dissolution kinetics um, is also what we use. So we use general chemistry principles of dissolution, um, um, but the 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 ability to then control all the speciation that you need to get into the solution and precipitate out is the work that you have to do to really make sure that you're developing the stoichiometries that you need. And obviously some of the materials in batteries have three to four chemical components. So they become a little more trickier to, to control than say, I don't know, zinc oxide or magnesium oxide or zirconia. So are you working on any other processes besides low temperature? Is the federal government funding the research or do the funds come from the private public sector? Um, both. I have funding from both the federal sector and also from companies. Um, um, am I working on other processes? I, I mean, I've always dabbled with processing. I never really, you know, I was trained as a physicist, so I didn't really regard myself as a processing type person. But over the years, we've developed some things. In fact, probably our, my biggest breakthrough, which I didn't patent, was a fast fire process for capacitors, of which there's probably three trillion of them made a year. And, um, and I was more interested in the thermodynamics and the kinetics of that than I was the patent, which is probably a mistake for Penn State and myself. Okay. Mind. Um, continuing, I guess, with like other uh, companies or industries involved in the process, how many other universities are working on the same technology? Yeah, so it's it's expanding. Um, certainly, we've had we've had people from Europe, we've had people from Japan that, that we've trained in the labs um, here to to, to 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 they come over for three or four months to then just see what we're doing. And programs are building up around the world. We need that because you know we have one idea. I mean, even colleagues at Penn State here, Dr. McKinstry, J.P. Maria. Um, Enrique Gomez, I already mentioned, and others have all looked um, and duplicated what we've done and expanded new ideas to how to proceed forward. And as you know, it's going to take a community to then really develop um, um, all the skill sets that we need to be able to make a big difference with this type of technology. And you need people that have, who are much better chemists, as I've pointed out, than myself to, to drive this. And I guess a follow-up to that would be, and then you have maybe mentioned it, is how long have you specifically been working on developing this process and or how long has, you know, ceramics been trying to get to, get to this process? I think there's always been an element of um, of trying to work with low temperatures. Uh, the Japanese in the 1970s looked at um, hydrothermal searing, which was a closed system. We have an open system, which is offers you a lot more. And then, and in the hydrothermal system, it's a closed vessel, with, uh, 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 and you know uh, the liquid gets in the pores, and it then minimizes the shrinkage um, uh, densification processes. Um, um, so it was 1970s. Um, we really started in around 2014, 2015. And I was inspired by a paper out of Finland um, where, um, where, where basically it was, to me, it was very clear because of, because of all the reading that, that, that was going on that I'd been doing um, around reading around geology and so forth. That was absolutely obvious to me what, what was happening, even though they didn't fully understand the mechanisms and how to proceed outside of that one system that they made these observations on. And so we then very quickly got moving. And um, I think within three months, we'd almost done 60 to 80 materials. We worked in secret for about two years. Uh, I made the first public announcement in France at a, at a meeting in Limoges. And I remember I gave the very first talk of the conference, a plenary, and um, and 
I think people were expecting me to give a very different talk on electronic materials. And um, I think people thought that, in fact, some people joked with me afterwards and said, many people in the room did not believe what they saw. In fact, they thought that I was fooling with their minds and just almost giving them fake news. And, um, and but, you know, people have duplicated the work, um, improved upon the work, and um, and now a substantial number of groups around the world are working on it. A comment that came in is, it would seem like the medical industry would be interested in new products that are repeatable, dependable, and fit within a tight tolerance, and also won't light up an airport metal detector. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, so... Um, uh, um, as I said, one, one of the applications we were for, looking for was was um, was a medical application, although that particular application wasn't implantable. Mm. In fact, a friend of mine at Sheffield who's followed our work very closely and, and I've guided them, uh, he's doing a lot of work on bioceramics and, um, um, and he's the one that I talked about in terms of putting living cells into the, into the process and and um, and so so that that's work that he's really pushing much harder. But he's he's done a lot of work in bioceramics. So a question is, and the, they mentioned you may have mentioned this before, but what is the fuel source for creating the heat? Natural gas or electricity or something else? It's it's just in fact we're doing things with with, with a local electric heater. And um, and so it's just it, it, it's just heating the, the the fixture of which the, which you're pressing into. Um, we we design it so we can un so it has most uniform heat, and we can drive it at different rates. Some of the heating rates can be as high as twenty five degrees a minute, and we see advantages of even being able to control the non isothermal heating rates in terms of designing the microstructure. And um, and the final products in, in in a number of different cases. So, are you going to? Do you have or do you plan to have several patents on this low temperature process? Yeah, uh, we ha we have a very strong very first patent that's that's now I think it's been it's got two acceptances for international patents as well and there's another six um, being processed um so will this process primarily replace current manufacturing processes or will this be equally applied to new material design um yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I think because uh, some of the bigger furnaces can put can load many, many more pieces, this is why it's critical to, for us to find ways of doing continuous processing with this. And that's that's another big jump that we've got to make. Um, um, and, until we have a continuous process uh, with very, very high quality parts, um, um, I think you're going to be left with batch type processing. So actually, we, we, I said we're looking at batteries. We're very interested in sodium batteries for you know the same way as you may make uh, fuel cells, but and, and just basically um, um, build things on a batch-like basis and then fire them and and, and 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 then try and push them along in that way. So there are hot pressing factories. There's factories that do hot pressing, and you have a whole floor of batch processes. Some of those types of applications uh, we see as one of the ways forward. That's why I was very, very pleased to see this, you know, dropping the powder metallurgy uh, cold sintering approach into a present manufacturing line and then developing much better properties with just adding these wonderful um, transient phases. Moving into the university impact, are you at a stage where this can be incorporated into undergraduate curriculum? 
Yeah, uh, um, it certainly could be. Uh, I, I know an ex Penn Stater that's a faculty member at Georgia Tech um, basically um, 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 built it already into a design course um, and got NSF money to do that. Um, a friend of mine that wrote a, who was writing a book um, on ceramic on ceramic materials dedicated. Um, a part of a chapter at the end of the book on the for, for the future of ceramics, where he dedicated a large part of that chapter to cold scenery. So, and, and that's that's an undergraduate textbook. And so, I, I do think that um, 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 the educational part of this is still developing because we don't fully understand it. But I think it's a very in fact one of the, one of the beauties of this is actually. You know, in principle, you could do it in your garage, right? You don't need to have a big furnace to do this. You can make a ceramic within 10, 15 minutes. And um, all you really need is a press and a small heater. And uh, you put the powder together, do your powder processing, get it to work, and you've got a dense ceramic. Um, any of us that have done pottery know that, you know, there's a long, broad out process of where you lose the pot, it goes, and then you, see, you get it a couple of days later. So to instantly see that, uh, that that return on your processing, I think, is also very exciting for, for people undergoing the education mission and learning more and more about materials. It can also be a process that can be taught and, and introduced into under-resourced um, communities as well. In fact, I've given talks at the uh, African MRS meeting, for example, on this subject and its possible potential for some of the brick making, make, making um, skills and processes that they have in places like Tanzania. Uh, for cold centered ceramics, would the electronic or other properties be similar? Would this process produce materials with even better properties than conventional process? Yeah, so, so I think mechanical properties are down a little bit, but electrical properties, especially when you're putting polymers in the grain boundaries. Um, I've worked on dielectric materials for for over nearly 25 years plus. And very recently, we've been able to design dielectrics in ways that I never thought you could do it. And it's much better than what you can do with all the conventional methods. Um, they would be more reliable, they'd be able to withstand higher, uh, they would have higher breakdown strength, and they also have very, very good properties at high fields. A comment comes in saying, thank you for the great information. You've created a new methodology to create materials that can be used in many, many industries. Another testament to the expertise that's held at Penn State, especially in the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences. Thank you. So our, our questions and comments seem to have slowed coming in. Um, I'd like to just put a call out for any other last minute questions that people might have or any comments you'd like to uh, pass along. You know, this has been a really informative talk and I think it really touches upon the broad science that EMS participates in. Now, I think it's, it offers for the first time a common processing platform for all forms of materials where a polymer person can work very easily with a metals and ceramics person. And then that was always very difficult before. People would put ceramics into polymers, but it would often be a post-process. When it all happens simultaneously, that really offers some really new opportunities.
Well, thanks, everybody. They were really good questions. Really appreciate the questions. Very well thought through. Thank you.